Hello everybody and welcome to Drydock episode 47 and just a couple of bits of channel admin before we get on to the main section of the video. First is that the winners of the Battleship Design Competition have been informed so I will be presenting to you their designs at the end of this video and as for why there weren't some sort of outtake designs in the last video that's because I had an attack of conscience and I thought well given that these designs have all been worked on fairly hard by viewers it didn't seem right to me to just suddenly pull up a bunch of designs that were faulty and may have been faulty just through possible ignorance of how Spring Shop works and then start ripping into them. Um, that didn't sit right with me. So instead, for the ones that are slightly more hilarious, um, I will, I'm going to main continue efforts to try and contact the authors of those designs to clear it with them. Um, and hopefully I'll present a outtakes video sooner rather than later. Um, for those of you who sent in designs that didn't uh, come up to the 45,000 ton limit, I know a number of you sent in supercruiser and battlecruiser designs. Um, I didn't ignore them, um, but obviously the competition was in, supposed to be for battleships at the escalator clause uh, limits. So I'm going with those winners first and winners of the other sort of supercruiser, battlecruiser categories, etc. will be coming next week, along with uh, the more hilarious prizes, hopefully. Anyway, with that out the way, the only other th thing that remains to be said in the channel admin section is, of course, next weekend is Tankfest. So I will be there Friday morning, um, uh, probably till about lunchtime, maybe just after, and Saturday as well. Um, probably all day depends how things go but i definitely will be there in the morning so yeah uh, look out for the person as i said in previous uh, videos look out for the person wearing a black t-shirt with the channel logo front and back if you happen to be there anyway on with questions so the videos we're taking questions for for the first part are the tiger class and flower class videos and uh, at the suggestion of one or two of you i'm just going to ramp all of the sources into one section here. So the main sources used for the Tiger video are um, The Grand Fleet by DK Brown, the British Battleships book by Norman Friedman, which does actually cover battlecruisers as well, despite its title, Battleships and Battlecruisers by Berea, which obviously is a go-to reference for almost uh, all capital ship designs, and, and numerous books on Jutland, some of which are appearing above you now. And one final one to add as a heavily used reference is British and German battlecruisers, their development and operations. Picture obviously there as well. And as for the flower class corvettes, two primary sources, um, main sources I should say, used for that, um, both of which are written by DK Brown, Nelson to Vanguard, and his separate book on Atlantic escorts. So, starting with the Tiger video, We Say No to Pay to Win asks, when you mentioned the Royal Navy having lower safety levels to increase the number of shells that they could fire, how many shells could they fire a minute? Now, this is an interesting one, because when you look at almost any battle uh, involving naval guns, whether that be World War I, World War II, or immediately before World War I, the first thing you will see is that theoretical rates of fire, um, which are often put up on websites and in some pop history books, are basically junk. Um, you can sustain a certain rate of fire in theory, um, either in gunnery practice or just on paper, from a gun in peacetime exercises and gunnery trials, etc., Reality, as it turns out, is a very different thing, at least until the advent of auto-loading mechanisms. So, I mean, some one of the biggest and best examples of that is the Kirov's main gun, Soviet cruiser, which um, theoretically should have given them a heavy cruiser gun that could outshoot light cruisers, and in the end actually gave them a heavy cruiser gun that would be hard-pressed to outshoot a battleship um, in terms of rate of fire. But anyway, specifically with the Royal Navy, 
the theoretical rate of fire of the British 13.5 inch and 12 inch uh, guns in World War One was between one and a half and two rounds a minute. So that's around roughly every between every 30 and 40 seconds. Now, when you look at the German guns, the 11-inch guns and 12-inch guns, certainly the 11-inch guns, again, theoretically, had a rate of fire of three rounds a minute, which meant, obviously, you would think they can fire faster. However, in practice, it turned out that the German guns at Jutland and other similar battles tended to fire approximately one round a minute per gun. And... Whilst at Dogger Bank, the British rate of fire, and also actually at the Battle of the Falklands, the British rate of fire was slightly slower than that. At Jutland, it's estimated roughly that the battle cruisers were firing around about a ra one round per minute or one round every 50 seconds as well. So their increased rate of fire, quote unquote, basically brought them into line with matching the Germans, which doesn't sound like that much when you when you just say it out loud like that. However, you've got to bear in mind that obviously we're talking about a 13.5 inch gun that's in an era where there's an awful lot of manual loading going on, being able to match the rate of fire of a significantly lighter weapon. That primarily being the German 11 inch gun, but also the 12 inch. So hopefully that answers the question. Chris Hopwood asks, if the Nelson class had had the engines of the hood, would it have played a bigger role in World War II? If the Nelson class had been given the 150-odd thousand horsepower engines of hood, um, they wouldn't have been the Nelsons. They, the, the Nelsons had considerably less horsepower than that, and as a result uh, were obviously slower. You physically wouldn't get Hood's power plant into the Nelson's hull. You would have to change something dramatic. Um, also, two propeller shafts, 151,000 shaft horsepower, you'd probably just break them. Um, in theory, if you stick 151,000 shaft horsepower through Nelson's design, it gets up to about 28 to 29 knots before the entire thing comes flying apart. Um, that's not to say it'll get to that speed. It that's the theoretical speed if you had sort of unobtainium propeller shafts and TARDIS like engine spaces. Um, so yeah, it's if if you're asking what would have happened if they'd built a Nelson class ship that could reach Hood's sort of 32, 33 knot speed, well, effectively, then you've got a G3. Um, and if you, the Royal Navy had a couple of G3s floating around, um, yeah, they would have played a lot bigger role in World War II. Um, for a start, you probably would have had a G3 floating around instead of um, Hood waiting for Bismarck, and that probably would have meant Bismarck's career ended at the Battle of the Denmark Strait. Um, quite possibly it might have been a G3 and Hood chasing after it. Um, both of which, both one of uh, one or at least one of which would have had a substantial refit. And then, of course, as I mentioned in a previous drive up when I talked about a theoretical G three refit, uh, you would have had a fast, powerful, heavily armed, uh, heavily armored battleship that could keep up with carriers. So the G threes, once the Kriegsmarine had been dealt with, would most likely have gone on to become fast carrier escorts in the Pacific. Panzer Gaming asks, how do you think a battle consisting of the Danish coastal defence ships Pedder Skram and Niels Jul facing the German battleship Schleswig Holstein during the German invasion of Denmark would have ended? Honestly, pretty poorly. Um, Schleswig, Schleswig Holstein. Good grief. Um, bears the um, somewhat dubious privilege of being one of the most modernised pre-dreadnoughts of all time. And Niels Jull is, well, no real way to put it, it's it's basically a light cruiser. Um, Peter Schramm has slightly heavier guns, but they're 9.4-inch weapons um, that the Germans had on several generations pre-dreadnought further back. So their ability to actually hurt um, Schleswig Holstein... Oh, good grief. Why, why Germany? Um, would be questionable, um, to say the least. And so, yeah, I, I don't think there's much of a chance of them being able to hurt it outside of maybe running it down and trying to torpedo it, um, which would be uh, rather interesting. But no, I think in a, in a straight-up gunfight, 
the German ship, which I'm not even going to bother trying to pronounce anymore, uh, is probably going to win. Marina Alternativa asks, uh, what kind of infrastructure is vital for a minor navy that's making a big upgrade in their assets? So, for example, if they had a 6,000-ton cruiser in the fleet and now they're getting a couple of battleships, kind of like the South American Dreadnought race. Well, as you point out in the rest of your question, docks and port expansions being obvious, because, yeah, you need you need a port uh, that's got a deep enough dra uh, depth so that your much deeper draft battleship can get in. Um, you've got to have docks capable of servicing it. But some of the lesser known infrastructure, I mean, assuming that you're buying this thing from overseas and therefore the heavyweight stuff like um, gun barrel replacements and such, well, uh, are being sourced from overseas one of the first things you're going to need is a very very big crane um, as i covered in the south american dreadnought video one of the major problems shortly before the dreadnought race started when chile and argentina decided to sign a treaty that temporarily limited their naval arms race um, was that when they came to disarm some of the ships they'd agreed to disarm it turned out that having bought these large warships from overseas neither of them actually had any dockside cranes capable of lifting things like turrets off so they couldn't actually disarm their own ships so if you're planning on things like barrel replacements or gun replacements and general maintenance like that you're going to need uh heavy lift infrastructure capable of moving it um otherwise you're going to have to send your ship over to whoever you bought it from every time something like that needs changing which is going to be an absolute pain um Plus, you're also going to need more extensive fueling infrastructure, whether you're using coal, whether you're using oil. Simple fact of the matter is, a battleship is going to use an awful lot more fuel, um, so you're going to need uh, some form of transporting that fuel that isn't going to take days and days and days. Now, if you are a minor navy that, as you say, has maybe just got a, a cruiser at this point or two, and for whatever reason has wound up with a battleship, what I would strongly suggest is that your port, you find a port and you say, this is the home port, we're going to put all the investment and infrastructure in there, and then you put some defences around that port, because obviously in a time of war that's going to be prime target zero. But for a nation that is otherwise running a relatively small navy, it's not worth trying to upgrade the infrastructure at multiple ports um, just for a single ship. So you try and fit everything into one, but also um, make sure that the infrastructure is large enough to accommodate more than one ship uh, at any given time, just in case something goes wrong. St. Rub asks, how effective were casemat secondary weapons, and when did they change to mounting secondaries in turrets? So casemat weapons effectiveness varied dramatically, and this generally was based on two things one was how big was your casement weapon relative to your ship so if you were say putting a four five or six inch casement weapon on a dreadnought battleship the stability afforded by the ship would be relatively good if you were putting a six or seven inch casement weapon maybe even an eight inch casement weapon on a small to medium-sized cruiser, or maybe even a small armoured cruiser, something like that, which historically was done, not so much because the ship is proportionally significantly less stable, uh, not less stable, but more lively, um, and the overall mass of the guns is uh, significantly more, which means uh, moments of rotation and such. Like, um, doesn't doesn't it tends to pull the ship around a little bit too much. Um, so yeah, size and stability of your gun platform make uh, a big difference with casement weapons, as with any guns really, but especially with casement guns because they're fixed to the hull um, in a way that's a little bit more obvious than a turret. Um, and then the other thing is height. And one of the major problems with casements with a lot of ships was that they were very often mounted too low which meant that once you're actually out at sea and you had waves and the bow wave of the ship itself as well as the natural sea state, um, you could either end up with the casements being flooded out or lots of spray um, or just being dangerously close to the waterline and not having that much in terms of visibility. And that could affect casements uh, very much. 
Other limitations to them were obviously they have a limited traverse because they're mounted in the side of the ship, so they only have an arc on the side of the ship depending on where they're positioned. That's why you'll notice um, in some ships a number of casements are mounted away from the main ba uh, secondary battery so that they've got either end on fire um, forward or aft. Um, and th to be honest, the, the main advantage of them is the fact that you only effectively have only need an armoured shield, and so weight-wise you can mount a lot of them. Whereas with turrets, a turret obviously needs all-round protection, and it's higher on the ship, so it imposes more stability penalties to the ship, and will weigh more in the first place. The advantages of a turret obviously being well, it's probably going to be better protected than the average casement. Um, you could usually see secondaries in turrets in at least twins, possibly more. Um, so you have a concentration of firepower there. And of course, being a turret, assuming it's positioned properly, it's going to have a much greater arc of fire and a much higher elevation potential. So you're going to be able to fire in more directions and at longer ranges. And obviously being higher up, they're less likely to be washed out by seas. And you've got a better vantage point from which to direct fire. Now, in terms of when they change to mounting secondaries in turrets, well, in the pre-Dreadnought era, second, the secondary battery very often was in turrets, but it was a lot bigger in terms of gun caliber. So in terms of the Dreadnought, where you have a primary battery and then a secondary battery and then later on an anti-aircraft battery, which may or may not be the same thing, um, there were a few of the early Dreadnoughts, a few scattered examples here or there, that had partially mounted their secondary batteries in turrets but they were kind of flash in the pan things that didn't carry on um, whereas if you want to look at uh, when the mountings definitively went over to turrets you're probably looking at the 1920s so whilst the Nagato class and the Colorado class had casement mounted secondaries and the Lexington South Dakotas um, etc uh, all were designed with casement mounted guns. The Nelson class introduced its secondary battery in twin turrets, all were mounted aft, and by the time you rolled around to the Treaty era, uh, era battleships at the other end of the Washington Naval Treaty battleship holiday, everything, King George V, um, North Carolinas, uh, obviously the, the Yamato, and uh, Bismarck and the Littorios, everybody at that point was sticking their secondary batteries into turrets. So yeah, Nelson kind of started that trend for when it actually stuck. S. Ben Anderson asks, you've presented some wargaming scenarios, what rules do you use and are they accessible online? Now, I have mentioned this briefly before, so I'll mention it quickly again. We tend to use a rather, shall we say, enhanced version of General Quarters 2. Um, we've added a lot of custom rules and such to allow for more accurate battle simulation as opposed to strictly tabletop naval wargaming, but General Quarters 2 is at the core of the rules that we use for uh, those scenarios. The Lesser Weevil asks, what role did Royal Navy submarines play during World War II? Did they have a significant impact on the war or would the money have been better spent on other ship classes? So the Royal Navy submarines in World War II are a quite often overlooked bunch, sadly. Uh, they did have a fairly significant role to play. Unfortunately, um, the reason it's not quite as prominent as, say, uh, the Kriegsmarine's U-boat division or the American uh, submarine arm is basically because the opponents that they were fighting for most of the war, primarily being the Italians and the Germans, didn't have anything like as much of a merchant marine as, say, the Japanese did, or indeed the British themselves. So that kind of mass campaign against merchant shipping was a little bit harder to pull off when your opponent neither needs a particularly large shipping arm nor has one. However, they did score a number of notable successes. Um, they did send several major German warships back into harbour quite often with torpedo hits, um, and they were very, very operational in the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean presenting something of an interesting problem for the Royal Navy because uh, immediately prior to World War II, one of the big things in the Royal Navy's submarine arm had been the development of the T-class submarine with its absolutely vicious 10-forward torpedo salvo. And this was designed for long-range fleet operations 
against uh, enemy warships and such like. Uh, primarily designed for combat in the Far East, although, of course, being British, they didn't stop to think about the fact that the Far East is very hot. So when they actually sent them out to the Far East, um, they did find the lack of air conditioning somewhat frustrating, um, hence why they were very often willing to trade their alcohol rations um, to the Americans for things like ice cream. Now, with regards to things in the Mediterranean, what they found with these big ship, big subs was that Mediterranean waters are relatively shallow for the most part, unusually clear compared to oceanic waters, and so a larger sub with a slower diving time that can be spotted even when it's 50 foot below the water. Not necessarily such a recipe for success, um, whereas these much, much smaller uh, submarines of things like the U-Class were very, very good in the Mediterranean. Um, because they're faster diving, much smaller, more difficult to see, and could hide a lot easier. And their primary role in the Mediterranean was trying to interdict uh, access supplies to North Africa, which they did, again, with a relative degree of success. And then once the uh, war, well, once Italy had uh, switched sides and the Kriegsmarine was largely dealt with, they also went off and operated against what was left of the Japanese merchant and uh, military naval arms after the Americans had got through with them. And they, they did have some role against uh, German merchant shipping and such, although the thing was to say most German merchant shipping was confined to the Baltic, uh, which was relatively difficult to get into, but there were some operations going on there as well. In terms of the money being better spent on other ship classes, I don't think so. Um, the number of German warships that they put to, out of action, either temporarily or permanently, certainly degraded the Kriegsmarine's combat ability, their continued predations on what German merchant marine actually existed did keep a lot of um, German escort ships and such like tied down in roles where obviously otherwise they could have been used in more active combat roles and in the Mediterranean it was the combined efforts of aircraft and submarines for the most part with a small amount of help from surface warships that interdicted Italian and German supply convoys to North Africa and kept a boot on the throat of Rommel's supply line which he would often uh, bemoan as the single worst thing that happened during his campaigns because uh, lots of uh, new tanks, fuel, ammunition, supplies etc that were sent to him just ended up at the bottom of the Mediterranean so if anyone has a decent salvage ship and wants uh, enough equipment to outfit a decent portion of the Africa Corps yeah, the, the run from Italy to North Africa is probably a good place to look. Warren Lemkula asks, How did the Temeraire class stack up against other 70-80 to 80 gun British ships of the line? And also, he says he saw on a postcard stating USS Pennsylvania 1837 was the largest vessel in the world. Was this true or was this a mistake? So, with regards to USS Pennsylvania, it certainly was a big ship of the line. There's no denying that. Um, and it was about five feet longer than most contemporary Royal Navy first rates. However, um, it, dep it depends when this clipping was made, because you see Pennsylvania w had a rather long gestation period. Um, in the sort of, If you looked at it in 1816, when it was authorised, or when it was laid down in 1821, you could probably make an argument that, yeah, at about 3,200 tonnes and 210 foot long, it's just about the biggest, at least, warship in the world. I'm not so sure about biggest ship, period, but certainly it's the biggest, near enough, the biggest warship in the world. However, it's not actually launched and commissioned until 1837, and by the late 1830s, no, it's not quite. Um, for example, you've got the Hercule class um, that the French have put into the water a, a year earlier, um, they displace 4,440 tons, albeit they are fractionally shorter. But then at the same time, you also have um, the Ocean type, the 118 gun first rates of the French Navy. Um, they actually displace significantly less, but they are seven or eight foot longer than the Pennsylvania. So uh, either way, by length or displacement, the French have them have the Pennsylvania beaten out. And as I say, at the time that Pennsylvania is laid down, you've got things like the Caledonia class 
um, ships of the line in, uh, in the Royal Navy. Um, they do weigh substantially less. They clock in about 2,006 to 2,700 tonnes. Um, but I say they're only about five foot shorter. By the time you um, get into the time when the Pennsylvania is actually launched, um, you are also having to deal with things like the uh, St. George class, which is technically Caledonia class, but it's slightly broader, so it displaces slightly more. Um, but then you also have um, HMS, things like HMS Queen, um, which is kind of of the period when the when the ship is uh, launched, the Royal Albert class as well. Uh, the Royal Albert class is slightly later, but they are about... 200 tons heavier than Pennsylvania and about 15 foot longer. Uh, so HMS Queen, which is the closest British contemporary to the time of launch of the Pennsylvania, is about 100 tons heavier, albeit um, and about five foot longer. So, uh, well, it's five foot longer once it's been converted. It's five foot shorter once it's uh, at the time of its launch. So, yeah, Pennsylvania is definitely one of the biggest warships in the world. As for making a claim of being the biggest warship in the world, mm, press F to doubt, I think. Now, as for the Temeraire class, uh, ships of the line which of the French Navy, um, one pictured here, compared to British designs, they were actually seen quite favourably. Um, they are very close in dimensions to the most common British class of 74-gun ships. And they avoided, to a large extent, the usual French trope when it came to capital ships of being um, slight with with the sort of a, a greater length to beam ratio, so being sl uh, significantly longer for a given beam compared to British ships. They were fractionally longer than most British seventy fours, but not by a tremendous amount compared to other French uh, classes of ship. Um, and the French did this primarily primarily with their longer hulls to try and get an extra bit of speed, but it, that came at the cost of the agility, sea keeping, and durability. So because the Timurers avoided this, um, they were pretty solid designs, very, very much directly compatible with a lot of uh, British ships, and because the French spent a little bit more time uh, shaping their ships because they weren't in quite the rush that the Royal Navy was at various points during the wars with France that eventually culminated in the Napoleonic Wars. Captures of these ships were very, very eagerly accepted into the Royal Navy. And so they were definitely a very good solid design um, and quite happily a fair number of them did end up in the Royal Navy um, thanks to various... Um, various battles as i say the, the the french navy was doing its best during the uh 18th and early 19th centuries but to a certain degree they were a bit like a very truculent version of the royal navy fleet reserve um in many respects spoon asks a bit of alternative history if the dutch navy had managed to get two of their design 1047 battle cruisers ready um, if one was present for the Battle of Java Sea, the other still stationed in the Netherlands when the Germans invaded, what kind of difference do you think these ships could have made? So, a design 1047 present in the Netherlands isn't really going to change that much of anything, to be perfectly honest, um, considering the Germans came by land and not by sea. Um, so, I, the best thing that it could have done probably would have been to skedaddle over to the UK, like a decent portion of the rest of the Dutch Navy, bringing all those wonderful juicy technological secrets, um, like wonderfully stabilised 40mm mounts with with it. Um, at which point, it probably would have had a rather interesting career as a serving with the Royal Navy, I would imagine. Um, but I won't go on to speculate about uh, what how that could have gone down, unless uh, someone wants me to in the comments below. Now, at the Battle of the Java Sea, that's a whole different issue. Assuming that somebody on one side or the other can actually get some decent gunnery going, um, a 1047 would be uh, a significant game changer, considering that it tips the balance from slightly in the Japanese's favour... Japanese's? Jap Japanese favour? I don't know. Um, into definitively being on the Allies' side um, with the firepower that this uh, this vessel commands. 
However, obviously, you then have to take into account that if the Japanese know that there's a Design 1047 floating around uh, in the Java Sea, are they just going to send four cruisers and a destroyer flotilla? Answer, probably not. They might well then send at least one Congo. Although, with that said, if they do send a Congo, again, assuming that um, somebody's woken up and decided to shoot straight, I would actually tentatively suggest that a 1047 might be able to take down a Congo in one-on-one -on -one combat if it came down to it. Yes, the 1047 has uh, smaller guns, and yes, its armour isn't going to keep out a 14-inch shell, but the Congo's armour isn't really going to do all that much against the 1047's guns either, and the 1047 is probably going to be but it has one more gun and it's probably going to be firing faster as well. Um, so, swings and roundabouts, but with the various little technological advances that the Dutch Navy had, I'd be willing to put my money on a 1047 slightly more often than I would on a 1942 Congo class. So, Battle of the Java Sea, if the Japanese are a bit stupid and they send out the same force they did historically, it's going to tip the balance well in the Allies' favour. If the Japanese send out some kind of matching force, then flip a coin, but I, the coin might land on the Allies' side more often than it does on the Japanese. David Maxwell asks, Is there a list of existing World War One and World War Two ships that are still available for people to visit around the world? Well, the list does get chopped and changed around a bit as ships are brought into preservation and opened up for museum service and obviously, sadly, others have to be taken out due to poor condition. But this is actually one of the areas in which Wikipedia is actually fairly helpful. So if you type in list of museum ships into Google, you'll find there is a Wikipedia entry there which quite helpfully lists all, all pretty much all current museum ships um, by location, uh, year launched, and vehicle, and vehicle type, ship type. So yeah, there's a surprisingly large number of uh, World War One and World War Two ships available if you happen to want to go all the way across the planet. Although unsurprisingly, uh, numer by numerical standards, a uh, significant number of them are in the United States. Kyla Stern asks, do you think there was any chance for the Axis in World War II to starve Britain into submission via submarine warfare, or even a chance to pull off Operation Sea Lion? Um, so with the submarines that they had, no, um, because between sonar and convoy escorts and convoys themselves, um, Britain was not going to get into a position where they were going to starve without doing something radically stupid or something going horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, they came close a few times to being on the downward spiral, but it never got anywhere close, close enough to starvation levels. Um, could they have done it, period? Well, if Donuts had gotten his 300 submarines at the start of the war, possibly. Um, <laughs> but he didn't, so... Uh, yeah, so yes, there was a chance, but they would have needed an awful lot more submarines an awful lot earlier. Also, um, growing a brainstem and realising that possibly the Enigma codes have been cracked might have helped <laughs> um, uh, later in the war. Um, as far as Operation Sea Lion goes, there was every chance of them actually landing troops on British soil. The chance of those troops staying alive and not prisoners of war for any particular length of time is very, very, very small. Um... To, act, to I say to pull off Operation Sea Line as in to launch a, uh, a, an amphibious invasion of the UK, yeah, sure, there's every chance they could have tried it. Um, in terms of actually succeeding, that's an entirely different question. Um, I don't think so. It's been war gamed so many times from everything from uh, amateurs all the way up to professionals, and without rewriting the book so much that you're basically not looking at World War II anymore, there isn't really any way of Sea Lion actually succeeding um, between massed air assaults, the Royal Navy just sailing large numbers of ships into the channel and just going, you know, what are you going to do about it? Um, 
or the British just setting the beaches on fire. Um, basically, the, it, yeah, the sea line is a no-go. Laurie asks, if you were sent back to ancient Rome circa the death of Caesar, how far would you personally be able to advance their naval technology, assuming that they're able to understand you? Well, that's a bit of a left-field question. Um, well, <laughs> assuming that they're able to understand me, assuming they don't immediately write me off as some kind of crazy person, which is entirely possible, um, assuming that someone actually bothers to listen, what could I do personally? Well, um, Roman naval technology was surprisingly advanced, albeit that a lot of their ships tended to be, we have trireme, and then we will make bigger, insert Roman numeral, ream, um, when it came to warships. So yeah, there's that. Um, with my understanding of naval technology and the Roman tech base, I could probably get them up to cannons. Um, they know how to cast bronze, um, albeit it is very expensive. And I know there's a kind of dimensions and bore width, etc., and method of making cannons. So there's that. I know how to make gunpowder, and the ingredients to make gunpowder are present and available in the Roman period. I wouldn't necessarily want to be standing next to some of the early prototypes when they're fired, but I'm pretty sure I could get them up at least to the level of bronze cannon. Um, in terms of ship building, I say they were capable of building some pretty large ships anyway, so I don't think they'd need too much help there. Um, I could introduce them to the center center rudder instead of rudder oars um, if they needed the helping hand with that. Um, yeah, I, ship building itself, I don't think I could help them with so much. I mean, I could probably sketch them out some decent plans for something along the lines of a race-built galleon, but quite how much use that is in the Mediterranean, well, I suppose gun, gun armed as well, but in the Mediterranean, you do need ore power quite often uh, in when you're talking about uh, Age of Sail and previously. So, uh, oh, the Gallius, yeah, I think probably, so probably the, the, realistically the most advanced I could get their naval technology to go to would probably be some form of possibly semi-armoured cannon bronze gun armed galleas and uh, well that would be a bit of an outside context problem for anyone else they came across I think maybe a turtle ship that would be funny Ian Carr asks, were the King George V's two-gun and four-gun turrets on the same barbette diameter, and if so, was there consideration of later King George V's being fitted with three quad turrets? Well, hopefully you can see from the picture above that the answer to the first part of the question is no. The uh, twin-gun <laughs> the turret was very definitely on a smaller barbette diameter than the quad. Um, that was all part of the weight saving that was brought about by the use of the twin. Um... And as for refitting or fitting the late King George V's with a fourth quad turret, um, apart from the barbette issue, even assuming that they had, I, I don't think it would ever have come across anybody's mind, um, largely on the basis that they, as I say, they, they took the um, super firing turret down from a quad to a twin for weight saving and stability reasons anyway. And by the time you're getting to the later King George V, when you've got all the extra top weight of additional light and medium anti-aircraft batteries, all the extra radar, fire control systems, etc. inherent to the sort of the mid to late war battleships, the idea of then adding several hundred more tons of fairly high up weight um, to enable the installation of a quad turret is probably not going to do the ship's stability any favours. So on to the Discord questions, and Wolfie asks, why didn't Bismarck or Tirpitz have the rangefinder in their number one turret when there is a place for them to be mounted? Well, as you can see here, turret Anton did originally have rangefinders, just like the other three turrets on the ship, but this is a good way of actually dating when a photograph of one of the Bismarck class was taken, because after 1940, early 41, they were removed, as you can see here, from Terra Anton, and this was because with the way that the German capital ship's bows were shaped, they found that water just, 
water and spray just came up and over far too much and basically left the things useless so rather than have a useless bit of kit that just weighed the ship down and uh, was a potential damage vector they took them away from Anton turret and plated over where they would have entered the turret so it meant that the turret was more secure and they had a few extra tons to spare for other things. Brent D15 asks, besides HMS Rodney torpedoing Bismarck, what other instances of battleships or other capital ships using their fixed submerged torpedo tubes against enemy warships exist? Well, relatively few and far between, and of course in terms of successful, not at all. Um, some of the ones that did occur otherwise historically um, we know that several British capital ships and several German capital ships at Jutland both fired torpedoes at various targets, obviously not scoring any hits. And as mentioned in the video on Operation Reinebung, there is a very, very strong possibility that HMS Hood, for whatever reason, fired a couple of torpedoes during the Battle of the Denmark Strait, which, um, as I said in that video, didn't actually achieve anything in terms of a hit, but may have saved Prince of Wales by making Bismarck and Prince Eugen break off for a short while. Matty83 asks, what were the AA capabilities of the Japanese 203mm guns and 155mm guns? That's 8 inch and 6 inch for those of us in Imperial land. So, as far as the Japanese 8 inch or 203mm guns were concerned, marginal and it wasn't really worth the effort um the fire control systems for anti-aircraft and surface fire control were completely separate so you had to switch between the two which was a little bit ponderous and the word ponderous is not something you want to associate with a system that you're going to have to switch to fighting fast moving aircraft with additionally the tracking and elevation of the tow three well it might have worked against a particularly lazy swordfish but realistically against the uh, aircraft uh, that the americans were generally putting into the sky it couldn't keep track of them fast enough anyway so um yeah theoretically yes practically no and with the 155s it's basically the same story they theoretically have a slightly better chance than the 203s albeit that the uh, mountings don't elevate to quite as high but again they just they don't move and track fast enough for to be really truly described as dual purpose unless you throw the ships back in time to fight something in the 1910s dash early 1920s era so yeah for both of them it's a case of yes in theory they can elevate high enough to be used in a dual purpose manner and the idea of a dual purpose eight inch gun is quite amusing um but practically speaking there's no way they can actually keep track of enemy aircraft enough to actually fire on a target they're actually aiming for a uh, blind barrage would be about the best you could hope for skippy oh skippy the bush kangaroo uh, he says how do you reckon the battle of the denmark strait would have played out if hood was replaced with king george v so if King George V and Prince of Wales are the two ships that engage Bismarck and Prince Eugen, then I think the Battle of the Denmark Strait has just become relatively one-sided. Um, King George V, in its battle a few days later with Bismarck, would show that it's got both its gunnery and its gun reliability were significantly better than Prince of Wales, um, which spells very bad things for Prince Eugen, who would be the one who's going to catch most of that in the face. Um, obviously, historically, Prince of Wales did manage to get the first hit on Bismarck, even with uh, its relatively terrible um, reliability of guns. So that's going to keep them occupied for a bit. And, of course, uh, King George V's armour scheme and layout is significantly better suited to um, absorb some punishment from Bismarck's guns uh, obviously better than Hood's was so most likely scenario in that case assuming that the Denmark Strait is approached in the same manner is that King George V will probably start hitting Prince Eugen quite hard and force Prince Eugen to fall back um, or possibly destroy it at uh, which point it's to King George V's versus Bismarck 
Um, will be okay, parent. Maybe one and a half King George V versus the first mark with the number of guns the Prince of Wales kept losing out of action. However, I think by that point the battle will have lasted long enough for Norfolk and Suffolk to catch up, at which point it's a badly damaged or sinking Prince Eugen and Bismarck versus two battleships and two heavy cruisers. At which point, yes, okay, uh, Bismarck being in top fighting conditions is probably going to lay some hurt down on one or the other British battleships, much as it did manage to do damage to Prince of Wales. But I can't realistically see Bismarck walking away from that, and neither is Prince Eugen. Jim Harrigan asks, how would King George V have fared against the Nagato? Common theme running through this particular batch of questions. And the answer here, I think, is pretty well. Um, King George V is significantly better protected than Nagato. It's also faster. It has superior fire control equipment and for the bulk of King George V's career also radar. And once you get into the lat mid to latter part of World War II, also fire control radar systems, um, as demonstrated quite handily by HMS Duke of York. So in terms of... Uh, yeah, fire control, accuracy, protection, and speed. King George V is winning on all of those counts. The only thing where theoretically King George V has a slight disadvantage is sheer firepower, because of course Nagato has 16 inch guns. However, as we said, King George V does actually have significantly better armor than Nagato, um, and once, uh, sort of, Prince of Wales being fresh out of dock aside, Generally, these guns are relatively reliable, and there are two more of them. So, combine all those factors together, and I think a King George V class on any given random battlefield is going to relatively comfortably have an advantage over in Agato. That's not to say a hit by 16 inch shell isn't going to hurt, because of course it is, it's a 16 inch shell. Um, but I think King George V is going to do a lot more damage to Nagato a lot faster than Nagato is going to do in return. Snoo Snoo asks, what characteristics made the Iowa's bow so awful in the Atlantic? What And what could have been done to improve her performance there without reducing speed? In very simple terms, it comes down to the fact that the bow was too thin. Um, it, the, the extremely long bow of the Iowa's is what gives them such a distinctive shape and profile compared to a lot of other battleships, including obviously all the other American battleships. Um, but it's basically there to give the ship a longer, uh, a better length to beam ratio, which therefore improves um, the ship's ability to travel through the water. Hence, it increases its speed. The bow isn't really there for any other purpose. And as a result, they made it quite thin to save on weight. Um, but that meant that the bow itself is not actually set, what they call self buoyant. Um, if you cut it off at just in front of the first turret it's just going to go straight to the bottom it just doesn't ha it's effectively it's it's supported by the rest of the ship obviously it does displace a certain amount of water but not enough um <coughs> excuse me and as a result you end up with a situation like this above um it doesn't resist dipping down into the water it, um because it's got a relatively low uh, surface area profile when it's doing a vertical motion and that means that you end up with the bow dipping significantly further than you would on other ships, um, like, say, Vanguard, which it operated alongside a few times. Um, as well as that, the bow shape itself, in terms of the flare and everything, is not particularly well, well built for um, deflecting the sea coming straight up like that. And so you end up with water coming over the bow quite often, and is again, as you can see there, kind of drowning the forward guns, which is not really particularly helpful. In terms of what could have been done to prevent that, well, make the bow a little bit uh, wider a lot earlier. So, but then that would have added displacement to the ship, and might have cost it a knot or so in speed so you'd either have to ramp up the power plant to even more hilarious levels um or just accept the i was there now 32 knot ship rather than a 33 knot ship jkm777 asks have did or did any navies experiment with thermal shrouding or similar technology 
uh, did they encounter issues with temperature effects on the barrels of naval guns? Uh, for instance, thermal shielding has been used on tanks to improve the accuracy of a gun. Did any Navy try a similar technique? So in terms of thermal shrouding and shielding on guns, um, no, the most navies didn't have much of an issue with that, but that tended to be basically because unlike a, a tank gun, a naval gun is incredibly heavily built. I mean, that's not to say a, a tank gun isn't heavily built, um, but naval guns are tend to be a lot more heavily built than land-based guns. So they just have the thermal mass of metal uh, to absorb uh, the, in, the the heat generated by the, the guns firing. Plus, also, there is the minor issue of a fact, the fact that very tiny thermal distortions in a tank barrel could cause you to miss when you're aiming at a target that's the size of a tank. Conversely, if you're on a ship and you're aiming at a vessel that is several hundred metres long and considerably taller than a tank, slight variations caused by um, thermal uh, effects on your gun that might slightly deflect your shell aren't actually going to make the, that much difference, if at all. It's like, okay, well, you might hit four foot higher on, the, on an enemy ship, which for a tank, if shooting tank on tank may be, well be a problem for a ship. It's like, meh, you still hit it. doesn't make much odds otherwise. Um, in terms of thermal shrouding for the entire ship, um, back in World War Two, no, because nobody was using infrared to try and spot ships at the time, uh, except towards the end with some experimental tech. These days, however, I do believe um, that a number of modern warships do use thermal shrouding technology as part of their stealth efforts to appear much smaller and harder to, to detect than you would otherwise think. Cat Killer Five, oi, uh, asks, uh, why did the Royal Navy revert to the traditional fore and aft armament for battleships after the N3G3 Nelson designs? Um, did the Nelson's teething problems make them want to avoid the format for the King George V and Lion types? So the main reason for the much more clustered uh, armament arrangement of the G3 and N3 designs was to try and maximise the absolute thickness of the armour plate because they were designed at a time when everyone was rolling around with 16 and 18 inch guns. The Royal Navy was not in a position to build as many uh, ba individual battleships and battle cruisers as other nations, well specifically the United States, it could have still outbuild practically everybody else. Um, and so they wanted absolutely top-end protection, and that meant as short a belt as possible, and clustering the main guns like this allowed for that shorter belt. However, and basically the same thing applied for the Nelsons, because the Nelsons were on a strict weight limit. However, once you got to King George V and Lion, the fact was you wanted a much faster ship, a much faster ship meant a much more extensive machinery space, um, whereas on the Nelsons, the machinery space was kept quite low due to the um, due to the fact that uh, it didn't have to go particularly quickly. Um, and the same for the N3s, actually. Uh, the G3s obviously would go very fast, um, but older propulsion technology and all that. Um, anyway, <clears throat> for the King George V's and the Lions... Basically, with the, with the amount of power they needed to get those ships up to their design speed, the advantages of the all-forward armament were still there, but the other thing was that with a much smaller battle fleet, there was going to be a need for all-round fire considerably more. Um, yes, the Nelsons had had issues, but apart from a few overpressure issues, most of them weren't to do with the fact that all the guns were forward. Most of them was to do with the fact that the gun mountings and turrets and etc. had been cut down dramatically in terms of their structural elements to try and save weight, which is what caused almost all the problems with the Nelsons' uh, main batteries. So, yeah, it was a desire for all-round fire, and, I mean, even, actually, to be honest, even when they were looking at the King George V, they did consider all forward armament um, but the advantages conferred by that for a treaty era battleship were marginal enough that the benefits of the more traditional layout overcame that 
Absolute Zero asks, what if during the Pearl Harbor attack the Japanese find the American carrier forces on the open ocean with their first wave of planes? Now, this is a little bit of an interesting one because all logic and reason says that, well, you're set up for dive bombing and torpedo attacks, you've just come across your primary targets, you should attack them. And if this was so, well, if it's a surprise attack, um, which obviously it is, the American carrier's not expecting anything, and the first wave of Japanese planes shows up and just starts dive bombing and torpedoing them out of the blue, there's not really much chance the American carriers will be able uh, to recover um, and fight back effectively before they are too badly damaged. So, yeah, say by all logic and reason, scratch several American carriers, and America's suddenly in a lot worse situation than it was historically. However... Given that this is the Imperial Japanese Navy, the Navy that famously criticised its opponents for changing their plans when it became clear that their plans weren't working, rather than just trying to force through and make the original plan work properly, it's also entirely possible that the first wave sees the American carriers reports back in back that back to their um, home carriers and just continues on their merry way to Pearl Harbor at which point that gives the Americans a chance to get aircraft on deck, get them airborne, and or at the very least, um, get them ready and prepared for, presumably, the second wave coming in to actually genuinely attack them. So it could go either way. As I say, by, by all logic and reason, um, that should be the end of the American carrier forces in the Pacific. But equally, given Japanese Peshant for strictly following the plan, even when the plan has quite clearly gone horribly wrong, it is entirely possible that uh, it has a slightly better outcome. I mean, heck, best case scenario for the Americans is they notice the first wave going overhead off to Pearl Harbor and go, hmm, I wonder where they could have come from, and then the Japanese are the ones who actually get surprised attacked as well. Absolute Zero also asks, what's better, more guns or more turrets for anti-aircraft fire? Say, if you can only have three-quarter the number of guns in single mounts that you would in twins, which is more effective at stopping planes? I can see arguments for both, but wondering what you think. I think this is going to depend largely on the calibre. Um, if you're talking about l lower calibre weapons, say 20mm and 40mm, the mountings are still relatively quick and therefore having just more guns is going to be better. So let's say if your choices are you can have a dozen single 40mm bofers or you can have eight twins, i.e. 16 bofers, um, but they are in twin mounts, I would go with the eight twins every single time. Um, or however else you want to have four quads or something like that, I would always go for the more numerous gun barrels every single time on anything up to about a 40 mil. Now, when it comes to the larger guns, we'd sort of do 4.5, 4.7, 5-inch type anti-aircraft weapons, they're usually dual-purpose guns. That's a much more difficult proposition, at which point I would have to say it depends entirely on your turret, um, for example, if you are stuck with, say, something like the British 4.7-inch twin mount as used on something like a tribal-class destroyer, you almost certainly would want more single 4.7s. Obviously not on a tribal-class destroyer itself, but if you were on a ship using that, those turrets uh, or those guns as secondary armament, you would almost certainly want more singles because the single 4.7 inch mount is capable of higher elevation and significantly faster tracking than the twin which makes it much more useful as an anti-aircraft self-defense weapon. Conversely if you're looking at something like a 5 inch 38 caliber um, twin mount that mount is just is perfectly adequate for in terms of speed and tracking to take down aircraft at which point again if you can get more guns out of using the mounts than using singles then definitely go for the mount dash turret so yeah it, i'd say it's basically whichever one gets you more barrels that you can actually maneuver and point at the enemy best 
Right, and so that brings us to the end of this week's Dry Dock, but it's also time to look over the winners of the Battleship Design Contest. Now, as mentioned at the beginning, those of you who submitted Battle Cruisers, Super Cruisers, and uh, rather amusing designs, they'll be dealt with separately in uh, next week's Dry Dock. However, the three primary winners um, who have all had emails and... Uh, hopefully well i know at least two of them have replied still waiting on the third one but anyway here they are so placing in first was uss rhode island a u.s navy battleship as the name might suggest now this ship is come with a rather nice historical context uh, section so i will read that out to you so it says, historical context. In 1938, orders leading to an additional two modern battleships were placed for the US with the US Navy. Congress was only willing to approve the ships uh, up to 35,000 tons standard and chose the compact South Dakota class for financial year 1939. As the global political climate, especially in East Asia, continued to deteriorate, a second pair of ships were to be added to the order. Here's where the Rhode Island class comes into play. USS Rhode Island represents a possible course of action for the conventional battleship fleet had Congress decided to approve of ships designed to escalate a tonnage whilst maintaining many of the same design goals as the South Dakota over North Carolina, given the USA's industrial capability being able to support such construction and also the fact that follow-up classes were aimed at 45,000 tonnes. So with that in mind, what does uh, this 45,000 ton standard displacement ship buy us? Well, it buys us 12 16-inch guns in four triple turrets. If um, This is using the 16-inch 45 caliber gun of the North Carolina and South Dakota classes, uh, effectively laid out in the same way that the Montana layout was done uh, with a pair super firing forward and a pair super firing aft. The secondary battery is composed of 25-inch 38 caliber guns in a dual purpose mounts, five per side. Um, we then have, because this is uh, escalated clause period, 32 1.1 inch guns in eight quad mounts. Obviously those in wartime probably would be replaced by the usual hilarious amounts of 40 and 20 millimeter bofors. Um, the armor belt is slightly thinner than would be found on a South Dakota or an Iowa at 11.2 inches thick. Um, but it is inclined 18 degrees, which gives it a degree of protection against most shells. Um, this is mostly a concession to the fact that it's very difficult to get 12 16-inch guns on 45,000 tons, I would imagine. Um, 14 inches is the main thickness of the main turrets, and the decks are a 6-inch thickness, which is a fairly good uh, deck protection. There is a conning tower, but I won't hold it against them. Um, speed is 27.5 knots with a complement of between 1600 and 2100. Uh, overall, in terms of its stability and such like, according to uh, Spring Sharp at least, it has adequate machinery, storage, and compartment compartmentation space, excellent accommodation, and workspace room. Overall, this ship has the kind of speed associated with treaty-era battleships for the most part. It can lay down an awfully large amount of firepower, with its primary weakness being the fact that, well, uh, yeah, that armor belt, if an enemy gets a few hits in first, that's going to hurt, I think. Next up in second place was a ship designed for the Italian Navy. This is called Impero. And this vessel um, was designed to, quote the designer, by taking a certain Italian admiral and locking him in a closet for long enough that his mad ideas couldn't percolate out. So this ship obviously is designed for a very different operational environment to the Rhode Island, but also comes in at 45,000 tons standard displacement. And this buys us 12 15-inch guns uh, of the Italian 15-inch 50 caliber a variety mounted in four triple turrets, uh, unsurprisingly, a pair super firing forward and a pair super firing aft. The secondary battery consists of a dedicated anti surface battery of 12 6 inch or 152 millimeter guns in four triple turrets, um, two per side. The anti aircraft battery consists of 16 90 millimeter 
guns or 3.5 inch guns and these are in single mounts all over the ship with a further 32 37 millimeter guns in 16 twin mounts and 32 20 millimeter guns also in 16 twin mounts um, so quite the layered heavy anti-aircraft battery the main belt is a 15 degree inclination 14 inches thick so um, yeah that's uh, that's quite well protected there with a 15-inch uh, main face on the turret and a 6-inch solid uh, armoured deck. Speed comes in again at 28, just over 28 knots. Uh, its range is relatively short, but then it's an Italian battleship, so c'est la vie, as they say. Um, overall, it's held to have cramped machinery storage and compartmentation which isn't exactly surprising um, it has good accommodation and workspace room and as you can see here this particular submission was kind enough to include a bunch of rather nice diagrams as did a couple of other submissions now the last uh, winner no, entry of uh, winner number three is the Lorraine a 45,000 ton battleship of the French Navy as may come as no surprise this carries 15 inch guns as well however this carries 10 guns in two quadruple mounts, one on each end, and a twin mount super firing forward. So kind of like a French version of the King George V, really. Um, secondary battery consists of 12 6-inch guns in four triple mounts, and then there is a anti-aircraft battery of 16 100mm or 4-inch guns in, uh, du in dual mounts, and in twin, in twin mount, sorry, uh, you've then got uh, 16 37 millimeter guns in uh, eight twin mounts and 24 13.2 millimeter machine guns also in twin mounts. Uh, the main belt armor on this ship is 13 inches thick and has the heaviest inclination at 20 degrees inclination. Um, turret face is 13.8 inches thick and uh, as with the other designs it also has a conning tower the range for a French ship is actually quite large 7,000 nautical miles and comes in as the fastest at 30 knots um, as far as habitability it's held to be adequate in terms of machinery storage and compartmentation and has excellent accommodation and workspace rooms so though is the winners there was a shortlist finally prepared out of nearly 100 entries. The shortlist was for battleships was down, came down to 11 entries that were all fairly close together. Um, one of the major issues that ruled out a number of entries was the... If you go into the performance section of uh, Spring Shop, you'll see there is a composite strength uh, tab and the composite strength needs to be one or two fractionally just above one but one is ideal um, quite a number of designs had to be ruled out because their composite strength was way below that um, and when you get into sort of 0.5 or 0.6 composite strength you're talking about mm, oh look a wave oh no we've snapped in half but never mind i say this is possibly why i need to do a how to spring shop video at some point so with that said there are your three winners um hope you've been with me with those last eight ten minutes worth of announcement and the winners hopefully will select be selecting their, their prizes soon enough um with more to come in the next dry dock thank you very much for watching and i'll see you another time